Uh, this is Lou Halperin from beautiful Lake Boone. It wasn't quite so beautiful. In fact, it was a very cold February back in 1915, just a few years ago, when Stowe and its neighbors received approximately 70 inches of accumulated snow. Uh, it accumulated over the month, not just in one day, but it was piled up along the sides of the road so high that there was barely any room to plow any additional snow. Driving in that month was also dangerous, just like driving in a canyon. However, as much snow as that was, it was not a record, only second place because of the great blizzard of 1978, which dumped 38 inches of snow on Stow. And that was not for the whole month, but just for two days, Monday, February 6th, starting at 10.20 in the morning to February 8th, a couple of days later, at 6.20 early in the morning. President Carter declared the area of the blizzard a federal disaster area, and the National Guard and the U.S. Army were both called out to rescue people from their snowed-in cars and get the roads open again. The record book declared 1978 the worst winter in 105 years. The 38 inches of snow that fell during the blizzard also broke the record for the most snow falling in a 24-hour period, which used to be 27.1 inches. Other records that were set by this blizzard was the highest winds, 79 miles per hour, and a record number of school closings. Although the National Guard and Army troops were called out to clear the roads, they were working mostly in the large cities like Boston and Worcester. None of them were working in Stowe. We were dependent on our relatively small road crew using relatively low power trucks with relatively small snow plows. One of that small road crew driving a low power truck with a small snow plow was John Mackey. He was then a road crew employee. John somehow got himself over to the old highway barn next to Hillside Cemetery soon after the snow began and started to plow the main roads. He said that it seemed that he lived in that truck for at least four days, working long hours, slowly making a dent in the road conditions. When he couldn't stay awake any longer, he drove back to the highway barn and climbed into a sleeping bag on the second floor for a few hours of shut-eye, then went back to the truck again. The Stow Lion somehow got food over to the highway barn to provide nourishment to the crews that were working the plows, and after the roads permitted, the lions also delivered meals to those unable to get to their food. Yeah. John and the rest of the crew were later awarded a certificate of survival, recognizing their non-stop work in freeing the residents of Stowe from their frozen jails. That certificate read, Certificate of Survival. This certifies that John Mackey has overcome, surmounted, and otherwise survived what shall heretofore be known as the Great Blizzard of 1978. It started at 1020 in the morning, February 6th, ended 620 in the morning, February 8th. President Carter declared it a federal disaster area. National Guard and U.S. Army called in February on 7th, 1978. The records that were set, worst winter in 105 years, record snowfall in 24 hour period, record winds, 79 miles per hour, and record school savings. So at the time I worked in Wayland, and I drove from Wayland home to Stowe down on Gleasondale Road, and I was parking on the road in those days, and so I just drove into the snowbank and left the car on the side of the road in front of the house. The next morning, when I looked out the upstairs window, all I saw was a mound of snow with a CB antenna sticking up out of the pile. In the, in the pile. Well, after a few days, uh, they had cleared the road somewhat, 
But uh, later in the week, they came by with a much bigger plow, pushing back all the embankments. And they had a selectman riding on the plow, and I assume that was for authority. <laughs> This is Anne, the Stowe TV director. I was living in Reading, Massachusetts in 1978. I had just started a job at Digital Equipment in Maynard. On February 6, I went to work as usual. I wanted to impress my new boss and get a lot of work done, so I stayed there into the early afternoon. I finally headed home in my ancient Toyota. The windshield wipers couldn't keep up with the icy snow, and I stopped several times to clear the windshield. I crawled up one, Route 128 to Reading just in time. If I had stayed at work another hour, I would have been among those people that were stranded on the highway for days. Hi, this is Lou Halpern, who was working in Lexington at the time, and left the job that I was working on at the time in Waltham, got on the 128. It was snowing, but it was okay. Cars were moving, I was moving, and got off on the exit to Route 2, but nobody on that exit was moving, so I pulled up behind them, not able to get around them or to move, and after sitting there for hour or so, figuring out there was no help going to come, just getting worse. Got out of the car, closed it up, walked home to about a mile to where I was living, and waited for a few days till we got the call that the car could be moved, and if I didn't move it, they would. So quickly got down, got the car unstuck, unshoveled, and back to normal if you can call anything normal in New England. Craig Martin, um, longtime resident of Stowe. Hi. Um, so the question is, where were you uh, when the 78 uh, blizzard hit? And I was just mentioning that I was working in Boston at the time for a large engineering company uh, on Stanford Street, which is in the North Station area. The snow started to fall sometime around, I want to say, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And we were a little anxious because the weather report said we're going to get a lot of snow. But the company was not about to let people go early. So we all stayed till, you know, the end of the day, basically. And then... Uh, my mode of transportation was um, the um, rail line out uh, of North Station that came out through Lincoln, you know, Concord, West Concord, onto Fitchburg at the time, I believe. So anyway, um, hopped on the train at North Station, um, and they, they were running the, they weren't running trains that involved a locomotive, they were running what they called bud cars made by the Bud Company, um, and those cars were self-contained. The engine was part of the single car, and that's what they were running on the rail line. So we got in the train, took off, snowing like heck, snowing like crazy. We got all the way out to um, Concord, where, it was, where I was going to get off, and the Bud car got stuck in Concord and couldn't move any further. Luckily, I was getting out of the car there to meet my father, who worked in Concord. And we got in, I got in his car at that station in Concord, and we drove to Stowe, where we ended up being housebound for about five or six days. Well, they worked on trying to clean up the roads, but um, that's my basic story. And, um, you know, made it home. Didn't get stranded, but there were a lot of my coworkers that never made it home. Spent the night on Route 128 in their cars, uh, jumping over snow banks, trying to get food. You know, it was a pretty crazy time for a lot of people that were weren't as lucky as I was, you know, to get home actually that night. So, anyway, that's my story. The blizzard of '78. Um, I worked at the Harriet G. Byrd Laboratory on Red Acre Road, and we were not allowed to drive. There was a state of emergency. 
and we were told to stay off the roads, but the animals had to be fed. At the time, we had thousands of rats, and we had a woodchuck house that housed many animals there that were research animals that um, were used in obesity studies. And so the animals had to be fed and, you know, watered and taken care of. So I set out to drive there and um, was stopped by the police, asked why I was on the road, and I told them that animals needed to be fed so they wouldn't die. And um, they let me proceed, and I went to work and took care of them. And, and that's one of my, my best memories of the blizzard of 78. So when my husband, during the blizzard of 78, my husband was in high school, and so they obviously closed the schools. And um, so his neighbor took his son and my husband uh, down to Disney World because there was nothing to do up here, so they decided to go on a little unplanned vacation. Have a good time. They had a great time. <laughs> and then what we did, I asked my mother-in-law a few years ago about the blizzard of 78, and uh, because nowadays you have all of this panic when there's going to be a snowstorm about bread and milk and everybody has to go to the grocery store and be prepared. And I was wondering if that was something that used to happen before the blizzard of 78, and she said she can't remember it, so I'm wondering if it started with that sense of not being able to get anything declared the emergency and the storm was over, um, they were, the government, the Commonwealth was authorizing any piece of equipment that could be moved, that would move snow to go out and help the highway departments. And I was working for uh, Ben Polson, the contractor, and he had a track propelled shovel dozer. It's uh, like a, a front end loader, but it's on steel treads. And um, <laughs> we, we got some plexiglass and built a cab for it and sent it off down Harvard Road, pushing snow. And there was another employee of Ben Paulson's who went out during the middle of the night in uh, going down by the golf course down on uh, Edson Street, got lost in the blizzard. And we had to follow the tracks, went over the golf course and down to, to find... He and the, the uh, this was another piece of heavy equipment, the rubber tired front end loader, uh, off out into the one of the greens of the golf course. Just I don't want to use his name, but he was lost in more ways than one. Um, back then, you weren't allowed to drive on the road unless you were a nurse, a police officer, public public safety person or you were going to the store for perishables. So the, the story was that you would have a loaf of bread in your car and you could drive mm -hmm. around and if you got stopped for violating the curfew, you said, well, I had a loaf of bread, I was going shopping. Did you come across that as a police officer? Oh yeah, well, it, it was just the tales that were being told. You know, you'd come back into the, the uh, into the station because the streets were empty and it was kind of eerie you know we had everything plowed but it was still you know this the roads were still white versus now where they use so much salt the roads are black instantly um, the roads were all white street lights really high snow banks and no cars and every once in a while you'd see a, a car go by and you'd say well is somebody violating the curfew let's go see what the story is and you know, it had come about, and I don't remember exactly how it came about, but they would carry this loaf of bread and say, I was just going going to get a loaf of bread for my family. I remember hearing about they mobilized the army out of Fort Devens, and they put, I guess they had a, a number of army trucks that had snow plows on, and they put them out onto Route 2. And within, I'm going to invent a number, within seven miles of Jackson Gate, the lead truck somehow got disoriented and stopped, and all of the other trucks plowed into each other, and so all the army trucks mm -hmm. were taken out of service almost immediately, wow. plowing snow. Because, you know, soldiers up at Devons didn't know a whole lot about plowing snow or, or what was going on. At, my wife at the time was a police officer in Bolton, and the cruisers couldn't get around, so I had a, a four-wheel drive truck and she was on patrol in Bolton in my four-wheel drive truck that had a snow plow on it. And I just bought the truck too. <laughs> and she was going down um, 
oh boy, I forget the name of the road. Uh, Forbush Mill Road. I won't forget it. And she was coming one way, and this guy, this kid on a snowmobile, was coming the other way, and. He was on the road, and she was on the road, and he panicked, and they met at the crest of a hill, and he dumped his snowmobile, and his head went right underneath the snowplow. Oh, and he didn't get hurt, but, you know, they had to get a lot of people to kind of extract him from underneath the snowplow of my truck. And I can remember getting my brand new truck back, and there were scrapes were on, along the side of it where uh, huh. different personnel had, you know, were pushing and moving and, you know, who knows what, but I was unhappy. <laughs> this is Linda Hathaway reading a memoir of the blizzard of 1978 by Lois Black, daughter of Stan Sherman. The memoir has been modified by Lou Halpern for publishing in the Stowe Independent newspaper. I grew up at 25 Treaty Elm Lane in Stowe, on top of Birch Hill. We had a driveway on the north side of the hill that was roughly a quarter mile long with a hairpin turn at the top. On a good day, it was tough getting up and down the hill in the winter with snow on the ground, and almost impossible when we had snow of any depth. I remember we were sent home from school early on February 6th, shortly after the storm started, and were told that there was a state of emergency. The snow just fell and fell, and after two days of constant snow, the sun innocently showed himself. There was so much snow on the ground, we couldn't open the doors and even the windows. Our Jeep vehicle was parked outside in snow above its tires. Our primary method of clearing the snow was with shovels and ice scrapers. The shoveling commenced. Dad and I shoveled a path down the hill, starting at the garage and continuing down the driveway until we hit Treaty Elm Lane. It was quite a job getting that driveway cleared. The CB radio was a popular communications tool that year. My dad, a former ham radio enthusiast and merchant marine radio engineer, was a regular on the local band with the handle Yellow Zonker. Dad got to know a lot of the people on the CB, and we had CBs in our cars as well so we could communicate in those days before cell phones. Driving was restricted during the state of emergency. Only those authorized to drive, or people like my dad who pronounced himself or authorized, were on the roads. Dad did bread and milk runs for us and for others. Purity and Freddie's store both were out of bread and milk, but Dad could find milk and other necessities in neighboring towns. No way was I going to be stuck on that hill and not go anywhere. We didn't have social networking and our friends didn't have CB radios, but the conditions were excellent for cross-country skiing, so off I went to visit my friends in person. The roads were snow-covered, and since no one was driving, it was safe to cross-country ski on Gleasondale Road. I skied to my friend's house all the way over to on Hudson Road to visit. I don't know how much school we missed. We missed a lot of time because of the blizzard and other storms that winter, but we did not have to make up the days missed during the state of emer emergency. Yay! My sister and her husband had gone to California for a job interview, and they had left their two boys with us. So in addition to our own three children, we had two extras. By about Thursday, the pantry shelf was running a little low. So my husband called the police to see if it would be okay if we drove down to the Purity Supreme to get some food. The police said that we could, so we did. My sister and her husband could not understand why they could not get back to Boston from California. They ended up flying to Phoenix and then to New York. Took the train from New York and then took the train from Boston out to South Acton. A friend picked them up in South Acton and brought them to our house so they could pick up their boys. When they got home to Westford, they could not find their cat, and she turned out to be up on the roof of the house next to the chimney for the warmth, and she was fine. <laughs> <laughs>